Welcome, and thank you for listening to Sandy Creek Stirrings. I'm your host, Joshua Jimenez. And if you're going to win souls, you've got to love souls. In spite of their meanness, in spite of the way they look, in spite of everything, you've got to seek to bring souls to Jesus Christ because you love them, because Jesus loved them, and because Jesus died for them, and you're trying to bring them to the Son of God. The Bible says in Psalm 84, 11, my last verse, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. I've based my whole life on that, that it pays to serve God, and I believe that with all my heart. God has given us a guidebook. God has given us a directional map, and that guidebook, that map, is the precious Word of God. Listen, don't just go and sit in the pew. Find somewhere to serve and serve as a family. Be a part of everything at church, and when you learn to love what God loves, um, your children will learn to love it as well. Homes are not that spiritually strong. We're getting overtaken by the world quickly, but unfortunately, we're pumping all the sewage in. You know, we're letting the world in when that ought to be a haven. Ephesians chapter 6 is one of the most famous passages of Scripture, in my opinion. In its verses, we find the armor of God. Have you heard of the armor of God before? Paul begins instructing the Ephesian church to put on the whole armor of God. And specifically within the passage of Ephesians 6, it's the armor that can protect them against the wiles of the devil. It's the armor that can allow them to um, resist the fiery darts of the devil. It's the armor that can allow them to stand in the evil day. And as Paul begins to, in Ephesians chapter 6, instruct them on the armor of God, he tells them to first, before anything else, to put on a particular part of the armor. I want to read to you that portion of the armor in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 14 when he begins talking about the armor. The Bible says, Stand therefore having, this is the first thing, having your loins girt about with truth. Notice, having your loins girt about with truth. Paul is telling the Ephesian church, and you and I, that before anything else, if we are going to stand against the wiles of the devil, the fiery darts of the devil, if we're going to stand an evil day, we have to have our loins girt about with truth. That term girt about literally means to fasten. It's kind of like when you put on a belt in the morning and you cinch it down. You cinch down truth to the very essence of your being. You fasten it to your being. And the reason why is, is because every other element will fail unless it's based on truth. You say, what do you mean? Well, if we look at the other elements of the armor, we look having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Think about that word gospel. There are some false gospels out there. There are some people who will preach a way to heaven that simply is not true. It's a false gospel. If we're going to have our feet truly shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, then we have to have the true gospel. And so it has to be founded on our Lloyds, gird about with truth. The helmet of salvation, there are false salvations. There are people who believe in things to take them to heaven that will never get them to heaven. And so we have to make sure we have the true salvation. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Hey, the Jehovah Witnesses wrote their own Bible. The Mormons claim to hold to the, Jeho- the Joseph Smith writings as part of the holy inspired scriptures. Those things are simply not true. They're false. And so we have to make sure our Word, our sword of the Spirit, is founded in truth. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the foundational issue of truth within this episode entitled, why I'm an onlyist. Why I'm an onlyist. Over the past couple of weeks, I've heard that term more than I think I ever have in my life, the term an onlyist. And I wanted to take time to talk about that today and how truth is going to make us arrive at the position of being what some might call an onlyist. You see, God wants you to know some things that are indeed true. First John in chapter 5, verse number 20 says, And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. 
So notice John is writing. He says, God wants to give you an understanding that you can know Him. Speaking of Jesus Christ, that is true. And we are in Him. That is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. According to this passage, my friend, God wants you to know the truth. God wants you to have a confidence in knowing that what you are believing and what you are teaching is true. Look, there is a confidence we can have in knowing the truth. Now, if we flip the coin over, Satan doesn't want you to have that confidence. Satan doesn't want you to know the truth. So he does his best to distort the truth and to set up false truths so people will chase after that which is indeed not true. You see, he has a, he has a, two, a twofold goal. Not only does he set up have truth so that people will chase things that are not true, but he sets up have truths to get you to try and doubt what God wants you to be confident in. God says, hey, I want you to have an understanding of what is true, that you're in him who is true, and that you know him who is true. I want you to have a confidence of those things, and I want you to trust them. But on the flip side, Satan wants you to doubt. Satan wants you to say, Do you, are you sure you're in him? Are you sure you're really believing the right things? Are you sure you're really teaching the right things? Satan wants to distort the truth that God wants you to understand. I tried to look up how many religions there are in the world. And I'll be honest with you, I could not find one single source that agreed. I looked at this website, and they said this many, pe- this many religions in the world. I looked at this website, they said this many religions in the world. And finally I arrived at one website that I can agree with. They said nobody knows for sure. Why? Because there are literally thousands upon thousands of religions with billions and billions of religious people covering the face of this planet. But within that, sadly, not all religions are true. In fact, each religion has its differences. Not a single one is alike in every area. How do I know that? Because they all have different names. If they were alike, they would be the same. And so, here's what I want you to note. As you go to church this Sunday or this Wednesday, and you go to church and your pastor holds up the Word of God in the pulpit, he preaches the Word of God, and he points to it and he says, this is the truth, follow this. There will be people who come along and they'll tell you, no, 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 that's not true. No, 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 you can't believe that. No, 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 no. And they'll try to destroy the truth that your pastor teaches. And in trying to tear down what we stand for, one of the biggest things that people point to is, look at how many religions there are. How can anyone possibly know which one to believe? There are just so many. Have you ever heard somebody say that before? Ever heard somebody say there's just so many religions? How can you be so sure that you are right? And then you've got the other people who say that because we say that this is truth and nothing else, they say we're a bunch of humbugs. We're causing division. We could experience such great fellowship if we would just get off our big high horses. They say, y'all are a bunch of only- onlyists. Now, maybe they don't, don't use the term y'all. Uh, that's me. But they say, you're just an onlyist. You, you say only this and only that and only this and only that. You're just an onlyist. Well, the fact is, friend, there are a bunch of onlys that the Bible tells us of. There are a bunch of onlys that the Bible tells us of. And I want to give you some of those today on why I am an onlyist and why the Bible teaches that for many things there is only one. Let's run through those real quick today. The Bible teaches that there is only one God. The Bible teaches there is only one God. Isaiah 43.10 says, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servants, whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he before me. There was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Isaiah 44, 6 says, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last. Beside me, there is no God. Isaiah 44, 8 says, Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. How about this one? Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. 
Look, there are people who want to teach that there are many, many gods. We see the the Mormons believe that there are many gods and that you can become a god one day, in fact, if you're a good Mormon. Hindus believe in 33 million gods. It comes from their belief of 33 different types of, of deities. Buddhists believe in five different basic deities. I'll tell you this. There aren't 33 million. There aren't five. And you won't become a god one day. Why? Because the Bible says there is only one God. You can claim these other gods if you want, but I serve the God of the Bible, the one true God. The God who, who by the way, created the heavens and the earth. The God who had a throwdown with the gods of Egypt in, in the beginning of Exodus, and by the way, he won. The God who parted the Red Sea. The God who pushed down the walls of Jericho. The God who made the sun stand still. The God who made an empty barrel for a widow down in Zarephath. He made it full. An empty barrel full. The God who kept three boys alive in a fiery furnace. The God who shut the mouths of the lions when a supper by the name of Daniel was thrown in. The God who meets my needs. The God who hears my prayers. That's my God. And by the way, the Bible says he is the only God, and it specifically says there is only one. Now, not only does the Bible teach that, that there is only one God, but the Bible also teaches that there is only one Christ. Matthew chapter 16, verses number 13 through 17 say this, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say? Notice, men, mortal man. Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, and are one of the prophets. He saith unto him, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon, Pan Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Notice what he said. He said, Thou, thou art the Christ. Is the Christ the, the, is that a singular term? Or is that a plural term? That's singular. The Christ, the Christ, is Singular, meaning there's only one. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. Jesus said, You know what? You are right to say that I am the Christ, the only one. Why? Because my Father has revealed it unto you. Paul, when he was finishing up his letter, his second letter to the Corinthian church, he was afraid. You say the Apostle Paul afraid? Absolutely, he was afraid. What was he afraid of? He was afraid that somebody would come into the church and deceive them into believing another Christ than the one that is true. The one that is true. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3-4 through four say this, But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ, for if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached. Paul warns, he says, hey, there's going to be people that come and they try to promote a different Christ. Don't believe them because there is only one Christ. Look, there are a lot of false Christs being promoted across this world. The Muslims promote a Christ that was a good man, but, well, he didn't die for our sins. The Jehovah Witnesses teach a Christ that was not God, and he, he died on a pole, not a cross. That's literally what they believe. Uh, the Mormons teach that Christ was the brother of Lucifer, birthed by, quote, Heavenly Father and one of his spirit wives. My friend, you can believe all the false Christ you want, but the Bible talks about only one Christ. The Christ who, by the way, John chapter 1 says was God from all of eternity. The, the, the Christ who, who, by the way, in Colossians chapter 1, says that he created the angels. He was not their brother. The Christ who, the Bible says in, in Matthew chapter 28, has always been and always will be. The Christ who left it all for me. The Christ who was born miraculously of a virgin. The Christ who lived a perfect and sinless life. The Christ who sacrificed his body on the cross for my sins. The Christ who was buried in a tomb. The Christ who rose again, physically and spiritually, unlike what the Jehovah Witnesses believe. On the third day, the Christ who is preparing a place for me. The Christ who is coming back. The Bible talks about there's only one 
Christ. If we continue, the Bible also teaches that there is only one Word of God. I'm going to read some verses. I want you to tell me if they're plural or singular. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 8 says, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the Word of God. Is that plural or singular? That's right, it's singular. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 2 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, that ye may grow thereby. James chapter 1, verse 22 says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Notice the Bible is singular. Look, people have tried to change the word of God. They promote a word of God that they say is not perfect. They promote a word of God that they say you cannot understand. The Catholics taught that for hundreds and hundreds of years. They said you can't understand it, so you don't need a Bible in your language. They, they, there's people who promote a word of God that you can't be sure of. Well, you, you can't be sure that that's the right one. My friend, I believe what God said about his word and the fact that he said there is only one. We have the word that is sharper than any two-edged sword. We have the word that is inspired. We have the word that is perfect. We have the word that has no contradictions. We have the word that is profitable. We have the word that is spiritual food. We have the word that, by the way, the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, in verse number 17, it thoroughly furnishes, meaning it furnishes through and through. If you buy a house that is thoroughly furnished, then when you move in, you don't need a single piece of furniture. It's completely furnished. There's nothing else you need. The Bible says, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 17, For the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Well, in context, it's speaking of the Word of God, because one verse before, verse 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration. Theos neustos means literally divinely breathed, God breathed. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. We don't need anything else. We don't need any other books. We don't need any other prophecies. We don't need any visions. We don't need any dreams. We don't need any revelations. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, um, when the, that which is perfect is come, speaking of the Word of God, when that which is perfect in co is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Those things are all in part. God did away with them at the completion of the Word of God. He only speaks to us through His Word now. And by the way, if the Word of God thoroughly furnishes me, then I don't need the works of some other man or some other woman to tell me what my Bible says. I don't need the works of Ellen G. White of the Seventh-day Adventist to tell me what the Bible says. I don't need the Watchtower Society to tell me what the Bible says. I don't need the Catholic Church, the Pope, the, the, the priest. I don't need the works of Joseph Smith. I just need God's Word because the Bible says there's only one, and it thoroughly furnishes me. Now, the Bible teaches only one God, only one Christ, only one Word of God, and then the Bible teaches only one salvation. John chapter 14, verse 6 says, Jesus saith unto them, I unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He's very specific. He says there's only one way to get to the Father. Jude chapter 1 and verse number 3 says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, what's he writing of? the common salvation. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was, how many times? Once delivered unto the saints. How many times was it delivered? Once. The Bible teaches only one salvation. It's the salvation without works, by the way. Romans chapter 3, verse 28 says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Galatians chapter 2, verse 16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 say, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's the salvation that is without baptism. That's what the Bible teaches, by the way. It's the salvation that is eternal. It's the salvation that cleanses every stain. It's a salvation that is secure. My friend, the Bible teaches there is only one salvation. The Bible teaches there is only one way to be saved, and that's through the plan of salvation as outlined by Scripture. 
Now, if we take all those things down, we come to point number five. The Bible teaches there is only one doctrine. Only one doctrine. First Timothy chapter one and verse number three says, "As I besought thee still, or as I as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge them that they teach no other doctrine." First Timothy chapter six verses three through four say this: If any man teach otherwise and consent not to the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing. Romans sixteen seventeen says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine, the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. Now, when he uses the term doctrine, he's talking about those core beliefs that we refer to as doctrines. They all fall under this one doctrine taught under the Bible. The Bible teaches one doctrine, and all these beliefs fit under it. Doctrines are those core beliefs that we clearly uh, see. They're clearly outlined within Scripture. Now, we have to be very careful to define the difference between a conviction and a doctrine, or what sometimes is called a standard. Convictions are beliefs that are based on personal opinion and facts relevant to that person. So, for instance, some people, for their for themselves and for their families, they don't play bull, pool. Excuse me, I can't pronounce stuff today. Uh, they don't play pool. They don't play billiards because they grew up gambling in the pool halls, and when they play pool, it reminds them of those bad times. So they say, for you know, for my family, we're just not going to play pool. That's a conviction. It's not clearly outlined in Scripture. You won't find a place in Scripture where it says, don't play billiards. But for them, that's a conviction they have. For them, it's wrong. Now, some people don't play with dice for the same reason. Some people don't play with playing cards. Those are all convictions. They're not clearly outlined in Scripture, and so each family has to make a decision for themselves on what they feel is best. And so we have to be very clear to distinguish between a conviction and a doctrine. A doctrine, sometimes called a standard, is clearly outlined in Scripture by biblical principle, scriptural example, or a clear-cut passage. And so what the Apostle Paul is telling not only the church at Rome in Romans 16, 17, but then the young preacher Timothy in 1 Timothy, he says there is only one doctrine— Referring to the doctrines that the Bible teaches as a whole, he says there is only one. You can't pick and choose doctrine. If it's doctrine, it's doctrine. Don't minimize it. If it's a conviction, then don't preach it like it's a doctrine. But there is only one doctrine. And so look, this podcast and and hopefully your church and you hold to the doctrines as clearly outlined in Scripture. And what you need to do is you need to go to your church, and you need to read through the entire doctrinal statement for your church. Go up and ask your pastor. Say, hey, can I have the doctrinal statement for our church? I want to read through it completely. You should be able to go to your church's website and read the entire doctrinal statement. Can I just tell you something? It's a, To me, it's alarming. One of the first things I look for when I look at a church, and I'm trying to see, you know, is this— is this a good church over here? Is the, you know, I'm looking at a church. First thing I'll do is I'll try and find the doctrinal statement. Now, I'll tell you something. Little red flags go up if I can't find their doctrinal statement on their website. If I can't find it, if I can't find what we believe and it's very clear, I'm not talking about these churches who put what we believe and it's like three paragraphs and it's so generic. I mean, they could it could be Pepsi for all I know. Um, I'm talking about like a very specific doctrinal statement with scriptures exactly talking about what they believe. You need to have that, and it should be a red flag if your church doesn't have a doctrinal statement. I'm just sliding that right in there, and we'll move forward. But the Bible says there's only one. This podcast holds to those doctrines as taught by the Bible. We believe the doctrines of God as clearly taught from the Scripture. We believe the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of the Trinity, the doctrine of baptism. By the way, I'll put this right in there. The doctrine of baptism is not only that you should be baptized and that baptism is not necessary for salvation, but also the mode and method of baptism is part of the doctrine. Look, John didn't go to the Jordan River to fill up his squirt gun and squirt everybody in the face. He went to dunk them. The eunuch, uh, remember when Philip was with the Ethiopian eunuch, and the Ethiopian eunuch um, understood everything, he believed on Christ, and he, and he, here's what he did. He grabbed a bottle of water from in the chariot, and he said, here is water, what hinders me from being baptized? No, they pulled it by a river, and he pointed to the river, and he said, hey, what doth hinder me from being baptized? 
There is no evidence anywhere in Scripture of baptism by sprinkling in Scripture or infant baptism. You won't find that in Scripture. I tell you what, the only method you find in Scripture is getting dunked, getting immersed. That, In fact, that's what the word means. The word baptize comes from the Greek word baptizo, which literally means to immerse, to put completely under. That's what it's talking about. And so, yes, the method of baptism is a core doctrine. If somebody teaches otherwise than that, then I'm sorry they're not holding to the one doctrine as taught by God. This podcast holds to the doctrine of justification, which uh, salvation as clearly expressed within the Word of God. Uh, to the doctrine of the church, the doctrine of separation, the doctrine of creation, the doctrine of Christ's return, the doctrine of heaven, the doctrines of hell. Those are all included, and they are that one doctrine as given by the Bible, and the Bible says there is only one doctrine. Now, if there's only one God, and there's only one Christ, there's only one Word of God, only one salvation, only one doctrine, then the Bible also teaches that there is only one church. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18 says, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Notice that term Christ used. He said, my church. Look, if there was just a whole bunch of churches, and all the churches are are the church of Jesus Christ, then he would have just said, I will build the church, or I will build a church. But no, specifically, he said, my church, because he's distinguishing the fact that there will be some who come along and they'll promote a church that is not his. Now, you may say, whoa, 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 whoa. There are a ton of churches. What are you talking about? And I would agree with you. You are right. There are some churches in the USA that I go to when I'm away from my church, and I love them. I support them. I will put money in their offering. I love their pastor. I love those churches. But when I say one church, I'm not referring to like an individual church across America. I'm referring to the denomination or the religion aspect of the church. And also, I'm not talking about the universal church either that the Catholics purport, um, which is, by the way, just false. I'm talking about the denomination or the religion as a whole. Let me explain it. You see, there are tons and tons and tons of denominations and religions across the world. There's Presbyterians, Methodists, Anglicans, uh, Catholics, Lutherans, Episcopalians, Independent Baptists, Southern Baptists, Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, Muslims. uh, You name it, it's out there. But what do the names actually mean? Like, why do they all have different names? We discussed this in one of our first episodes on Baptist history way, 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 way back. And um, the denominational title denotes a system of beliefs. So if someone says, I'm a Catholic, it's not a random title they chose, although I think I've met some Catholics who just pulled it out of the air and said, I'm a Catholic. But um, it's not just some random title they chose, it's, it's pointing to a system of belief. So if they say, I'm a Catholic, then they believe certain things about God, certain things about Christ, certain things about the Bible, certain things about salvation, certain things about doctrine that they hold to. They say, I'm a Catholic, then they're going to hold to a Bible with the Apocrypha in it. They're going to hold to salvation by um, not only by grace, but along with good works and baptism. When they talk about Christ, they're talking about, um, uh, obviously, the Savior of the world, but who has a... A mother that is still a virgin. And we'll talk about that in Five Things Wrong with Catholicism, but they're pointing to a system of beliefs. And here's the problem. We come to something very sad because only one, then only one of these denominations backslash religions can be right. Truth, by definition, is singular. Look, they can't disagree and both be right. Not in the areas of doctrine, at least. Look, I've searched the, the, the beliefs of most religions across the world. There is a reason I am an independent fundamental Baptist. It's not because my parents raised me to be one. It's not because that's what I'm forced to believe. It's because when you're really searching, truth isn't that hard to find. If you actually want to find it. And it's pretty easy to see when something's false, if you actually want to see. Why? Because when you examine religions in this area, if they teach a God that's contrary to the Bible, then they're false. If they teach a Christ that is contrary to the Bible, 
they are false. If they teach a Bible that is contrary to what God says about His own Word, they are false. If they teach another salvation, they are false. If they teach another doctrine, they are false. There can only be one. You see, you can't get a Presbyterian with a, with a Baptist— and a Baptist says baptism is by immersion, and a Presbyterian says, well, no, baptism is you can sprinkle people. I'm sorry, those are two different doctrines. One of them has to be right. You can't get a Catholic with a Jehovah Witness, and the Jehovah Witness says, hey, you know, Jesus was created, and a Catholic says, no, he wasn't. One of them has to be right. Truth, by definition, is singular. We can't all be right. So here's what I'm telling you. All these names are pointing to a system of beliefs, They can't all be right. There must only be one. When it's all done and said, when it's all done and said, there can only be one. That's why Christ said, my church. Now, within this episode, there will be some people who have made it this far, and they will say, well, that's just your interpretation. Josh, that is just your interpretation. All those passages you read about God and Christ and my church and the Word of God and salvation and and doctrine, those are just your interpretations. That's how you define it. That's how you interpret those passages. There are many interpretations, so lots of us can be right. Well, that's why there is one more point in this podcast episode. Number seven, there's only one interpretation. Look, this is attacked so frequently, and people will try to justify the differences between religions and the religion realm by saying, well, there's so many interpretations. That's yours. That's mine. We can both have our own. I will wholeheartedly agree. We can both have our own. And I will wholeheartedly agree. There's a bunch of interpretations. But that means one is right and the rest are wrong. Look, we can't read a passage and come to different conclusions and say we are both right. It's impossible. You say, how can you know? How, how, yes, it is. No, it's not. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. The word private there is the Greek word idios. It literally means private, separate, apart, their own. Nobody can read the Word of God and have their own interpretation. The Bible is clearly stating you can't have separate interpretations. You can't have your own. There is only one interpretation. You can't come to God and say there are many gods. You can't come to Christ and say he was the brother of Lucifer. You can't come to God and say it's not perfect. You can't come and and say that I can be saved by my works. Now, you say, yes, I can. I can say whatever I want. You're absolutely right. You can say whatever you want, but it doesn't make you right. It's not your interpretation. It's whether you believe the truth or not. Because the Bible says, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, that there is only one interpretation. So how do we know the truth then? Some of you may be wondering, that's great. How do we know the truth? How do we know the truth? Jesus outlines it super clear in John chapter 8, verse 30 through 32. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What did they have to do to know the truth? If ye continue in my word. My friend, if you want to know the truth, you must know the Word of God. How do we know the Word of God? How do we judge between all the religions, all the denominations, all the doctrines, all the churches, all the teachers? How do we judge through all those? You have to know the Word of God. Very quickly, there's three things you need to do to know the Word of God. Number one, you need to study. need to study. You've heard this verse so many times on Sandy Creek Stirring. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study. Look, I, I, there are so many of you, you've been faithful listeners for a hundred-something episodes. We're coming up on one full year of Sandy Creek Stirrings, and you still don't study. You have to study. 
I'm not talking about reading your Bible. I'm talking about studying, going to something difficult and saying, I'm going to study this out and I'm going to learn it. I'm going to study it like I'm studying for a test. I'm going to study. You need to have study time. Learn to study out the doctrines of salvation. Study out baptism. Study out Christ. Study out Bible translation. Study out heaven. Study out hell. Uh, study out everything. You need to learn to know the Word of God. Number two, you must always compare line upon line, precept upon precept. The Bible says in Isaiah 28, verse 10, For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, upon line here a little, and there a little. You must learn to compare everything together. Look, one passage of Scripture will not contradict another, because the Bible is like a perfect puzzle. Every piece has its place, and everything fits perfectly together. And what you can do is you can pull a, a, a puzzle piece out, and you can try and cram it in a spot that it doesn't fit in. And it may stay there. It may work for a little while. But the problem is, if you want to complete the puzzle, one day you're going to have to pull that piece out and put it in its proper place. In the same way, you can read the Bible and come across a verse and pull it out and say, this is what this means. But eventually one day, if you want the whole Bible to fit together, you're going to have to put it back in its right spot because it can't stay there. Look, you cannot make a proof text out of something. You say, what is a proof text? A proof text is something where they rip a verse out of context and they say, this is what it means when really... They just ripped a puzzle piece out, and they're trying to cram it in a spot that it does not fit. How do you make sure you don't make a proof text to something? Well, when you examine Scripture, you always make sure it's in context. What's the subject matter of the entire passage? Subject matter of the entire passage. Just because we read Judas went out and hanged himself, go and do that likewise. We ripped both of those out of context, and we have to be very careful we're not making a proof text out of those. Number two, you have to define them. You have to define the words. Get you a good dictionary, a Webster's 1828 dictionary. You can go online and search the words. Look, there will be words within your Bible that you won't understand. I'm not going to lie. There's some old words. You'll need to go in and you'll need to define them. But don't believe the hogwash people tell you you can't read. You, you shouldn't use the King James Bible because it's got old words in it. Go back to our Bible version series we did way back at the beginning of this podcast, and we'll give examples of, of, of old words in every version. Every single version of the Bible has old words in it, but I never hear people complain, well, I don't like the ESV because it has old words in it. No. Get you a good dictionary and define the words. And then number three, compare with other passages. You take everything line upon line, precept upon precept. You, you, you p compare it all together so you get that perfect puzzle. And then number three, if you truly want to know the Word of God, then don't take somebody's word for it. Prove it yourself. Even within this podcast, don't take my word for it. Prove it for yourself. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21 says, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Never just take someone's word for it. Study it out for yourself. So when you do those things and you begin to know the Word of God, you can begin to identify what is true and false. When a Mormon comes along and says, there are many gods, I could say that's not true. The Bible says in Isaiah 44, verse 6, I am the first and the last. Beside me, there is no God. When a Jehovah Witness comes along and says that Christ was not God, I can say that's not true. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. When a Catholic comes along and says you need good works to be saved, I can say that's not true because the Bible says in Romans 3, 28, we conclude that a man is justified by faith in Jesus Christ and not by the deeds of the law. Look, friend, anytime someone comes along, and says something contrary to what the Word of God says, I can look at them and say, that's not true, because the Bible says otherwise. Don't be tricked into feeling bad when others say, you're being divisive. You need to be more accepting. You, you aren't being all-inclusive. You need to be more understanding. You're just secluding yourself from others and fellowship. You are just an onlyest. Hmm. Simply look back with a kind smile a good knowledge of the Word of God, and say, if you mean that I believe there is only one God, only one Christ, only one Word of God, only one salvation, only one doctrine, only one church, only one interpretation, then yes, you're right. I'm an onlyist. 
But I'll tell you this, the Word of God promotes a lot of onlyism. Number two, there are a lot of other onlyists with me. And then number three, can I just read you something about what God responded to somebody with when they didn't like his quote-unquote only stand? Here's what he said to them, Matthew chapter 4, verse 10. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the God, or the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. My friend, we can stand confident in what we believe because God clearly shows us so many times there is only one. Make a stand, friend. Don't back down. Don't be shamed when people say, you're just an onlyist. Just say, no, no, no. The Bible says there's only one. Stand on the word of truth. As you do, keep looking up and keep stirred up for the cause of Christ.